Please take a moment to reread the question to get an understanding of the setup before listening on. We have gone ahead and drawn in the third charge, which we have labeled three, and you'll notice that we've drawn it closer to the charge located at the origin, the one that had a charge of just positive E. And the reason for that is because we're trying to minimize the net force that's acting on this charge right here. So we would not want to move this charge too close to charge two because charge two has an overall charge of negative 27E, which is much greater than the charge on charge one, which is only positive one E. So to minimize the force, we basically want to move charge three as close as possible to charge one and kind of get it further away from charge two. Now, we don't know the distance between charges one and three. We're actually trying to figure that out in this question. So what we will do is label the distance between charges one and three as simply x. Now, if you study the diagram carefully, you should then be able to determine that the distance between charges two and three could then be represented by L minus x. So it's important to get those distances labeled from the get-go. Now, we're going to come up with an expression for the net force that is acting on charge three. We can begin very simply by saying that the net force acting on charge three will equal the force between charges one and three plus the force between charges two and three. And let's talk a little bit more about those forces. Consider the fact that both charges one and three are positively charged. So that means that charge one will repel charge three. So we can imagine that there is a repulsive force pointing to the right, pushing charge three to the right, and that would be labeled as our F13. Now let's consider the force acting between charges two and three this force is going to be an attractive force because charge three is positive, whereas charge two is negative. So opposites attract, therefore it's an attractive force, and therefore we can see that the charge two is going to be pulling charge three to the right. And we're gonna label that force F23. Notice that both forces are directed to the right. So that means that they're both positive. They're both pointing on the positive X axis. And now we can proceed to fill in the expressions for each of those two forces. Let's begin with F13. According to Coulomb's law, the force acting between those two charged particles would be K multiplied by the magnitude of charge one multiplied by the magnitude of charge three. And then that would be divided by the distance between those charges squared. Remember, we labeled the distance between those charges as X, so this becomes X squared. We add that to a similar expression for F23. We have the Coulomb's constant K multiplied by the magnitude of charge two multiplied by the magnitude of charge three. And then this is divided by the distance between charges two and three squared. That distance we labeled as L minus X. Just don't forget to square that. So this is our expression for the net force acting on charge three. And what we can do next, perhaps, is plug in some values for the charges. We'll leave K as a constant for now. We don't need to plug in yet. Q1 was given a value of positive E. And since we're taking the absolute value of it, we'll just say E. And then Q3 was given a value of positive 4E. And again, because it's already positive, we don't really need the absolute value. So we'll just have times 4E. And then this is all divided by x squared. Coming over to the other force expression, we look up the charge of Q2, and that one was negative 27. But remember, you're taking the absolute value of it. So the negative 27e would actually become a positive 27e. And then again, the charge 3 had a value of positive 4e. This will all be divided by L minus x squared. So there it is, the net force acting on charge 3 with some values plugged in. We can simplify it a little bit further by multiplying out the numerators. So for example, in the first numerator, you're going to have 4k multiplied by e squared. And then in the second denominator, we'll have to do 27 times 4, which is, of course, 108. So that will become 108e squared. Well, let's go ke squared for consistency. 
and then that is over the L minus X squared. So this is looking a little bit nicer. It's going to turn out to be easier if we factor out a greatest common factor. Now they have a lot in common actually. They have a factor of K, they have a factor of E squared, and then they actually have a factor, if you look at the four and the 108, the greatest common factor there would be four. So in other words, we can factor out a four K E squared from both of these force expressions. In the first force expression, that would leave a 1 in the numerator over the x squared. And then if we divide 108 by the 4 that we factored out, we get that 27 back. So we have 27 over the L minus x squared. This is looking really good, but we have to minimize this net force. So we next turn to calculus because we're minimizing a function. We're minimizing force as a function of the variable x. And you'll remember from calculus that to minimize a function, you're going to have to compute the derivative. Now, all of the items in front here are constants. They're actually a constant multiple of this variable expression. So we don't actually need to regard those. The only thing we're trying to minimize is the net force based on the variable part of this expression. So we're really just going to focus our attention on the variable part, again, because this is all constant multiple stuff. It will not affect the finding of the minimum force value. So what we'll do is we'll just sort of rewrite this function by looking at that aspect of the expression. And it would be helpful if we rewrote the powers in their negative form. It turns out to make the derivative calculation easier. So this is x to the negative 2. And then similarly, if we bring this up to the numerator, we're going to have 27 times L minus X also to the power of negative two. Okay, and again, we're not regarding that constant multiple. We can next do the derivative. We're just going to call this sort of F prime. We have some basic power rule right here. This is just going to have a derivative of negative two times X to the negative three. Over here, it gets a little tricky. You have a chain rule. So you're gonna multiply the 27 by the negative two. This makes a negative 54, and then this is times the inside function, L minus X. Subtract 1 to get negative 3, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, so the derivative of this stuff right here. The derivative of L is 0 because L is a constant. That length between the two charges was a constant, and then the derivative of minus X is a minus 1. So we basically now have a negative 54 times a negative 1. That becomes a positive 54. So we'll rewrite it accordingly. And then if you remember from calculus, once you have your derivative to continue finding the minimum value, you have to set this equal to zero. Basically, you can think of this as our force function, as, as a function of x. There's some minimum value here. At that minimum value, the slope of the tangent line there is zero. So that's why we're setting the derivative equal to zero. Just a little reminder of the calculus there. Let us add this 2x to the minus 3 to the other side. We could then divide both sides of the equation by 2. We then might find it helpful to rewrite those powers back in their positive form. So we're going to send the L minus x to the denominator. So it's a power of positive 3. We'll send the x to the negative 3 to the denominator. So it becomes x to the positive 3 as well. Maybe we could cross multiply, so we would have 27x to the power of 3 is equal to L minus x to the power of 3. And then it would be useful if we cube rooted both sides. Be a little bit careful. When you cube root both sides, you're going to have to cube root that 27 or whatever number you have in your homework question. So in this case, the cube root of 27 is 3. But if it's an ugly number that doesn't have a, you know, that is not a perfect cube, you'll have to pick up a calculator and do that. So now we'll have 3 x to the power of 1, and this will equal L minus x. We can add the x to the other side. We get 4x is equal to L, and then divide both sides by 4. And we can see that this x value is simply going to be L divided by 4. If this was a calculus course, you might have to do a first derivative test or even a second derivative test to prove that we indeed have a minimum value for the force. But in this case, we only have one value of x. It's probably safe to assume this is the value of x that minimizes the net force. We haven't found the actual value of x because we have to plug in the value of L. And if you go back and look, it was 8 centimeters for the value of L. So 8 centimeters divided by 4, we get an answer of x is equal to 2 centimeters. That is it for part A. Let's go back up and look at what part B had requested. 
it said, what is the minimum magnitude? So in this case, we're going to want to go back and grab our net force expression, which is right here, and we're going to have to plug in the two centimeters, although we want to make sure we're plugging in a standard unit. So instead of two centimeters, we're going to let x equal 0.02 meters. So you just move the decimal place over twice to the left. So let's plug this all in. So all the values have been plugged in. Note that K has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9, and E has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Also note that we changed L from 8 centimeters into 0.08 meters, again, by moving that decimal twice to the left. So just make sure you plug in all those values correctly. When you do this, you get a net force of approximately 9.21 times 10 to the power of negative 24. We've plugged in all standard units, so the answer would be in newtons. So this is the correct answer to part B.